Hi guys, I'm back again with uh, page 24. I'm reading chorus on page 24. Fair are Hecuba's women. Your vulnerable queen has fainted. She has collapsed and lies speechless on the ground. Don't let her just lie there, you bitches. An old woman flattened, fallen flat on her face. Get her up on her feet. So here the chorus leaders, they are together. They are joining with uh, all the Tro Trojan women are joining together and asking, where are Hecuba's other women? Where are the supporters? Where are the helpers of Hecuba? Your vulnerable queen has actually fainted. She has collapsed and she lies speechless on the ground. Don't let her just lie there. You be just an old woman fallen flat on her face. And look at the alliteration used by Euripus, fallen flat on her face, in order to demonstrate how traumatic and devastating the war is for its survivors and especially for the queen, Hecuba. Uh, Euripus is actually using that alliteration um, to get emphasis or to give emphasis on her pathetic fall and she says that she has fallen flat on her face. And Chorus, they are asking Hecuba to get her up on her feet. So they are asking and they are requesting her to get up on her feet. Hecuba, no, leave me alone. Your kindness, my girl, is no kindness to me. Let me lie here just as I fell. What I'm suffering and have suffered, what I will suffer it is more is more than enough to make anyone fall and never, never get up again. Now, Hecuba here collapses to the ground in tears and the chorus leader, they are trying to help her, but Hecuba brushes her off and she believes that she deserves all the pain she has endured. And uh, Hecuba, that's why she says, no, leave me alone. Your kindness, my girls, is no kindness to me. Let me lie here just as I fell. Just leave me here. What I am suffering and have suffered and what I will suffer yet is more than enough to make anyone fall and never get up again. And look at the words um, suffering, suffered and suffer. Here, Euripides is actually trying to use um, polyptotin. Polyptotin Polyptotin means the rhetorical repetition of varying words that actually share the same root. Uh, for example, suffering and suffered and suffer all comes from the same root word suffer so there, there are there are the variations and here Euripides is actually using that polyptotin in not to stress on the pathetic situation or, or the uh, grief of the Trojan women what I'm suffering and I have suffered and what I will suffer it all this actually all through the polyptotin Euripides, Euripides is actually showing that um, Hecuba is actually um, a victim of war and she is suffering O oh, you gods, what god were you to us, betrayers? And yet people still call upon gods when bad luck or history has flattened them and the whole of the world has collapsed. So Hecuba here considers asking the gods for help, but later on she realizes that they have actually allowed her to suffer so far. The gods have actually allowed her to suffer so far. And so seemingly unlike it is it seems unlikely to ease her suffering now. So she thought about asking to God and now she says that, see, God has betrayed me. What betrayers? Oh, oh, you gods, what God were you to us? Betrayers. And yet still people call upon gods when bad luck history, uh, bad luck or history has flattened them and the whole of their world has collapsed. So even though she is struggling, she, she is suffering. She would like to call on God. But here we are getting the idea that all Europe is trying to show us that uh, God has actually forsaken her. God has actually forsaken Hecuba. And Hecuba has begun to lose faith in the gods. And that's what uh, we could get from here. Although she once prayed to gods for the relief, now she, she believes her fortune now is destined to be random at best and miserable at worst. And after falling so drastically from grace, she actually believes that the future and her future specifically is impossible to predict. She couldn't even predict the future. Now she says, so let me tell you how, uh, how fortunate I was born lucky to heighten the tragedy of what has happened to me now. Now she is starting to recount her fall and she says that she's starting to say her story. She recounts her fall. Let me tell you how fortunate I was. I was born lucky to heighten the tragedy of what has happened to me now. 
So she was a royal person. She was actually queen and now she has fallen uh, down as a slave. And that is actually heightening the tragedy. So the fall from, when I told you the tragedy, I told you the fall of a person from a high position is what determines the downfall of the person. That that determines the heightened, heightened tragedy of uh, the downfall of that person. So here, Queen Hecuba is now reduced to a slave and that heightens the tragedy and that's what exactly Hecuba says here. Of what has happened to me now, I was royal by birth, I married a king. My sons excelled not merely because I bore so many, but because they were the best among the Phrygians. What's more, they were Trojans and such Trojans as no Greek woman or barbarian could ever boast of bearing. Now she is being very, she is taking the pride in her own life and in her own husband and sons. That's why she says, I was royal by birth and I married a king. My sons excelled, not, be, not merely because I bore so many, but because they were the best among the Phrygians. And now here, Hecuba actually thinks that she had a very good life. She had, she bore good sons. She, uh, her sons were the best among the Phrygians. I told you Phrygian is another word for tro Trojan. So best, best among the Trojans. What's more, they were Trojans and such Trojans as no Greek woman or barbarian could ever boast of bearing. So she is having that pride in her mind and she believes that. So she is trying to take the positives and negatives in, you know, while she is suffering. And she says that I had a good life. I had a very royal life. And that's what she's trying to say here. So I'm just repeating that again. As she was a, once a queen, Hecuba's fall from grace is the most dramatic uh, part in any of the characters, more dramatic of any of the characters in the play. This is the most dramatic part because Hecuba's fall is the fall from a queen's position to a slave. And that actually heightens the tragedy. And I saw every one of them slaughtered by the swords and spears of the Greeks. And now she is saying her beautiful sons, the best among the Trojans, what happened to all of them? I saw every one of them slaughtered by the swords and spears of the Greeks. By their open graves I have stood. See, I have stood in their open graves and cut my hair in mourning to cast upon their bodies. And so many bitter tears I have wept for their father Priam. And she has been crying for the death of her husband Priam. No one told me of his death. No one brought me the news. And she says that no one has actually told me the news. With my own eyes, I saw him hacked down on the altar steps of our holiest temple and the holy city sacked as the Greeks ran riot. And look at the words, look at the phrases, with my own eyes. And she says that her tragedy is worse because she has actually witnessed the death of her own husband. I saw him hacked down on the altar steps of our holiest temple. And look at the word our, uh, it's inclusive language because Hecuba being the queen is trying to involve all the Trojans in her sufferings and in her, in her feelings and attitudes. And that's why she's using our holiest temple. And the whole city sacked. The whole city has been sacked as the Greeks ran riot. All the daughters I brought up with such care to make them fit brides for princes. I saw them snatched from my arms. Their good breeding wasted on brutal soldiery and foreigners. And now she says, but she talks about her daughters. She brought them, brought them up with such care. Who are the daughters? Cassandra. Polyxena, she brought them up with such care and she wanted to make them fit brides for the princess, but they were snatched away from my arms. Their good breeding was wasted. That's what she says. There is no hope they will ever see me again or that I will see them. So hopelessness, the theme of hopelessness, you can see there and she, Hecuba has got no hope. There is no hope they will ever see me again or that I will see them. I will ever see them. And now, like the keystone to my arch of misery, in my old age, I must go to Greece to finish my life as a slave. So Euripides is actually using a simile here. And Euripides, through the words where Cuba says that, and now, like the keystone to my arch of misery, I don't know whether you, you may know the word key, keystone. Keystone is the main stone that you use for the construction. And it's that stone which actually stabilizes the building. And now she is referring her own suffering, her own personal suffering. She's comparing that to the keystone. And she says that that is the keystone of my arch suffering, my slavery. 
And now, like the keystone, so the beautiful use of simile, um, like the keystone to my arch of mystery, in my old age, I must go to Greece to finish my life as a slave. And even in my old age, I have to go to uh, Greece to finish off my life as a slave. And that is the keystone of the arch mystery. And that is the most important mystery in her life. And that's what she says. So that um, simile, you have to remember, that's, uh, that's really important. She says that that is the keystone um, of her mystery. Before that, I just missed one point when uh, she says that, based on brutal soldiery and fullness, there is no hope they will ever see me again or that I will ever see them. We are actually getting the nihilistic views of Hecuba or the nihilism of Europe is, is portrayed through the vo voices of Hecuba. And she says that she, what do you mean by uh, nihilism? Nihilism means life has no meaning. A philosophy saying that life has no meaning. Everything is, uh, everything is useless. No meaning for anything. So Hecuba is actually grieving for the future. It's grief. And she says that. She believes that. She, or she thinks that there is no meaning for life. There is no hope. All that have given meaning to her life has actually gone now. Her husband, her beautiful sons and daughter, everything that, have, that has given meaning in her life has left her now. So through that, she now views, or we could say that Hecuba now views her own life as, or she has got a very nihilistic outlook towards life. So continuation. And what work they will give me, a woman of my years, to be a gatekeeper? Looking after the keys, me, the mother of Hector, or a kitchen skinny, kneading the bread down. And now she says that, what job am I going to get? I'm an old person. I, I, won't, I will be just a gatekeeper, or I'll be kneading the bread. I won't sleep on a royal mattress anymore. The flow will be good enough for my bony back and wasted flesh. Now she says that, I don't need, I won't be getting royal mattress anymore. I won't be sleeping in a royal mattress because she was a queen. Now, no more. And now she says that the flow will be good enough for me, for my body back. Again, alliteration for my body back to stress on, to emphasize on her situation. And wasted flesh, worn out, second hand dress will do for me. And she says that being a queen, now she's, she would just need a second hand. She, by not being a queen, just by being a slave, she doesn't need royal dress. She just need even the second hand where she would get only maybe a second hand dress. That will do for me. Even rags will be best. That's what she says. Rags even. The sort that well-bred women never see, let alone wear. They will have to make do. They will have to make do for my worn out second hand body. So now, and look at the phrase second hand. She uses, I think she uses that twice. Yes. Uh, and wasted flesh worn out second hand dresses and again she says second hand body and that repetition of that phrase second hand actually shows that she has got a feeling that she is worthless there's nothing in her nothing with her anything will do for her so second hand is best that's what she says dear gods what a terrible retribution all that has happened to me and will happen because of that one woman and her love affair and now she is Questioning gods, dear gods, what a ter terrible retribution. All that happened to me and will happen because of that one woman and her love affair. So all that has happened to me is just because of the love affair of that one woman. And who is that woman? Definitely it is. Uh, Hecuba is point pointing towards Helen. Just because of the lust uh, of Menelaus. Sorry, uh, just because of the lust of Prince uh, Paris and Helen, all this has happened. So she, she, she is actually blaming Hecuba there. Sorry, sorry. Hecuba is actually blaming Helen there. Dear gods, what a terrible retribution! All that has happened to me and will happen because of that one woman, and that one woman refers to Helen. Cassandra, my child, what violation will end to your consecrated virginity? That mixed mystic ecstasy you sh shared with Dionysius and all the gods. And you, my poor girl, Polyxena, where are you now? So now she, Hecuba, calls out of her ch child, Cassandra. She calls on her child, Cassandra, first. What violation will end your consecrated virginity? That mixed mystic ecstasy you shared with the gods, Dionysius. And you, my poor girl, now she's calling upon the second one, Polyxena, where are you now? None of my children, neither, neither sons or daughters, and there, 
where so many of them so i have got none of them now none of my children neither neither sons no daughters and there were so many of them can give me such a so much as a helping hand in my ministry see and there were so many of them can give me so much a helping hand in my ministry all people who would i who i would expect me to help me while i'm in ministry there's no one i haven't got sons daughters it's usually the husband sons and daughters who usually help people in their ministry but now she says that i haven't got anyone they're all gone they are all gone that's what she says they are all gone again look at that phrase a very short sentence they are all gone hopelessness grief hecuba's hopelessness and hecuba's grief can actually be seen there the theme of grief so why try to help me up so after saying all this now she is asking me asking the chorus now look see all the people who would like to help me or who would be who you should be helping me are no more they are all gone now now why should you help me she is asking the chorus why what they are all gone so why try to help me what for what have i to look forward to again nihilistic view i told you before i haven't got anything to look forward to hopelessness having that feeling that everything is um, useless nihilistic view so that's what i said all that have given meaning in her life has left her now and she feels that she thinks that life is meaningless so nihilistic view um where am i okay what for what have i to look forward to well take my hand and lead me step by step these feet of mine so used to deep carpets all the luxury of troy that belong to a slave now and now she she is giving us a beautiful um she's talking about each and every aspect of her life and she says that these feet of mine my feet has been used um with the deep carpets which actually is a luxury the luxury of troy they belong to a slave now these feet which is used to which is used to deep carpets is actually belonging to a slave now bring me to my bed my straw pallias and stone pillow throw me throw me down there on my face and let these tears my torturers with me senseless so now she says that just give me stone pillow i don't need any more royal mattresses and pillows just give me my straw pallias uh pallias straw pallias is actually the mattress referring to very thin very thin padded um, mattress just bring me that and stone pillow throw me down there on my face and let these tears my torturers with me senseless so hecuba here actually confronts the reality he, she confronts the reality that nothing in the world is a world has actually has got a real existence nothing in the world even money nothing is ex- real so that's why she says in next line and let these tears my tortures with me senseless well good fortune it's all worth nothing nothing is permanent that's what she is trying to say well good fortune it's all worth nothing so it's not it's worth nothing again nihilistic view there is no happiness the lucky ones are dead and now finally to end her to end her speech she says that the lucky ones are the dead ones because priam and hector they they are not going to see all those things they are not going to go through these sufferings so the lucky ones are actually the, the dead people that's what she is trying to say now we are going to listen to the first testament chorus teach me god teach me gods of song some harsh lament dissonant with tears and howls help me to sing troy's sorrows invent new sounds for my grief the greek horse on wheels has ruined me brought me to the edge of the grave made me a slave so what happens here is the chorus the chorus of trojan women they begin a ritual lament for the destruction of troy and they mourn the loss not only for the city but also for the civilization and their lament starts in the traditional very traditional manner appealing to the muses the gods of song that's what she, it says teach me gods of song so they are appealing to the uh, muse gods of songs asking that they help to sing them to sing to sing troy's sorrows invent new sounds for grief so this appeal to the gods is particularly poignant considering that the prologue indicates that god has actually abandoned the trojans in the in the prologue we actually see that the god has gods has actually abandoned the trojans and that's why this particular 
um, uh, appeal to the gods is very poignant here. And the chorus, chorus actually starts to recount the events brought about by the Greek hordes on wheels. So we are getting the whole stro story, the story that I told you in the background PowerPoint, you're getting it here through the words of the chorus. They are telling us what happened, how did they, how did they, uh, how did the Greeks um, succeed it? And what happened to Trojan? How did the Trojans get got defeated? Everything is explained here by the chorus. So let us read that. Greek horse on wheels, new sounds for my griefs. The Greek horse on wheels has ruined me, brought me to the edge of the grave, made me a slave. So each and every Trojan woman actually believes that it is that Greek horse on wheels actually gave them or made them, uh, made them a slave. Unguarded they left it by the main gate, its gold chic pieces gleaming, and from its belly the clash of armor played, a rumbled like thunder, muffled and threatening. Now Chorus is actually giving us um, giving us ideas about what has actually happened, what happened during that time. So the Trojan horse, um, unguarded they left it, and by the main gate its gold cheek pieces gleaming and from its belly clash of armor plate rumbled like thunder similarly the armor plate uh, of the soldiers rumbled like thunder muffled and threatening so we ran to the rock of the citadel the whole population shouting come out everybody all our troubles are over wheel this wooden offering for caesar's daughter so they were so happy because they didn't know the trick and they were so happy to see the the token of peace i told you when they give something as a token it's a, it's like a token of peace to end the war and so we ran to the rock of the citadel the whole population was cheering and shouting come out everybody all the troubles are over wheel this wooden offering for Zeus's daughter athena of troy inside the wall so they were actually uh considering this as an as an offering to Zeus's daughter athena of troy and say and so as a result they wheeled the horse in and who ran from their houses their houses the faster the young men or the old all high on the singing and the joy as they laid hands on the monster and look at the word look at the way a word um, Euripus is using to refer to the Trojan horse the monster on the singing and the joy as they laid hands on the monster that was more than it seemed and would doom them all to die so that was destined or doomed to and doomed them all to die. Then it seemed the whole nation of the Phrygians ran to the gate. The whole of the Trojan, everyone ran to the gates, eager to bring that smooth plain to Icon of mountain pine and the Greek ambush within it, without knowing that the Greek soldiers were hiding in it. As an offering to the virgin who drives the immortal horses of heaven for the Trojans' destruction, wrought with cables of twisted flags, they heaved it like a black ship to the stone shrine at the heart of the temple complex of Pallas Athena, altars soon to drip and smooth floors run slippery with Trojan blood. So the chorus is actually here recounting the events that brought about by the Greek horse on the wheels, revealing how Troy was actually defeated. And they confess that bringing the horse into their gates was actually an act of devotion to Zeus's daughter Athena. That's what they said. The Trojans unwittingly laid hands on the monster, on that monster, and thus sealing their fate. That actually sealed their fate. And he, here again, there is a reference here for the Trojans' destruction, wrapped with cables of twisted flags. They heaved it like a black ship. That's a, that's a, it's, it's a beautiful simile there. Heaved it like a black ship. Black ship, as you know, it indicates indicates it's a vessel of death indicates that it's a vessel of death without knowing that it's a vessel of death they brought it in so black ship indicates it's a vessel of death and this simile like a black ship the simile actually evokes the destruction contained within the horse's belly heightening anticipation of the moment when the greeks actually emerged from the monster from the actual monster from the belly of the horse so they heaved it like a black ship to the stone shrine at the heart of the temple complex of Pallas Athena, altars soon to drip and smooth floors run slippery with Trojan blood and soon started, the smooth floors started to, started to be slippery with Trojan blood. Again, graphic imagery, violent graphic imagery we are getting. 
Then the melodious African pipe honeyed the air as the dark hood of night enfolded Troy. In celebration, after the day's exhaustion, the whole city was singing, dancing feet, stamping in acceleration to the rhythm of young girls' voices, flickering torches, casting puddles of light in the darkened palaces and on the faces sleeping. And in the eyes wide awake and glittering in the pitch dark night, at that time, in our great hall with the others, I was singing all our favorite songs to Atinius, Caesar's daughter, virgin of the mountains, and joining in the dancing. Then suddenly I heard a terrible howl, the unmistakable sound, sound of murder, a terrified scream rising from the streets of the whole city. So uh, Chorus is trying to say that I was at that time, I was singing song, and now all of a sudden I heard a terrible howl, the unmistakable sound of murder, a terrified scream rising from the streets of the whole city. Children grabbed hold of their mother's skirts, their pale hands plucked at her gown, fluttering with fear. And look at the look at the see look at the imagery given to us, the pathetic situation of the Trojans. Children grabbed hold of their mother's skirts, their pale hands plucked at her gown, fluttering with fear. The god of war had sprung his trap. The ambush strategy worked perfectly thanks to Pallas Athena, whose powers secretly inspired it. I told you because, um, I told you, the reference to Athena is because I told you at the very beginning in the prologue, it says, um, it says that um, a Phocian inventor by the name of Epius, who lived on Parnassus with the skills he learned from Athena. It, Athena is the goddess that actually helped um, them to create this um, Horse, and that's why it says the ambush strategy worked perfectly thanks to Pallas Athena, whose powers secretly inspired it. The Trojans were cut down in their homes, in their own homes, in sanctuary, beheaded where they lay. So uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, it's, it's epithet. Epithet means very, it's a descriptive, descriptive term. Okay, it's, 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 it clearly says that the Trojans were cut down in their, in, in their own homes, in sanctuary beheaded where they lay sleeping a whole beheaded where they lay sleeping a whole generation of women raped in their own bedrooms and that situation actually heightens the tragedy a whole generation of women raped in their own bread bedrooms breeding bastards for the greeks desolation for troy look hecuba they are bringing andromache in a greek baggage wagon her bosom is heaving with sobs as the grasps heck as she grasps Hector's son, Astinax, clinging to her breast as they rise and fall like a bag of oars in the sea. So the, uh, the fall of Troy was actually very bloody. It is actually really bloody and tragic because it, it happened amidst the joyful celebration because they were celebrating the joy. The Trojans had let their guard down and assumed that they were safe at last after 10 years of conflict when they saw the Trojan host. And they were cheering and they were so happy. When the Greeks erupted from the host, which the Trojans had assumed was a hollow gift, they killed not only armed and ready soldiers, but the pathetic situation is that they even killed unarmed, unprepared men and women and raped the women and killed children. And that is the most tragic situation. That's why it is so uh, pathetic. Uh, that is why this particular situation of Trojans is really pathetic. So we must remember that, and it's it's a really important part where we are actually getting the background uh, through the words of chorus. <laughs> 